and you love. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this webinar titled Exploring the Future of AI, a deep dive into OpenAI's GPT-4. And our guest speaker for today is Professor Johan Stein. My name is Tiangele, and I'm a senior lecturer at the Mopak Business School. Before we start with the webinar, allow me to introduce you to Professor Johan Stein, who is a human-centered artificial intelligence advocate and thought leader. He was recognized by Swiss Cognitive as one of the top 50 global voices of AI. He's a research fellow at the School of Data Science and Computational Thinking at Stellenbosch University and an adjunct professor at the School of Business at the School of Business at Watson University. He was a finalist for the 2022 IT Personality of the Year Award, and you are able to find him on afrobusiness.net. So over to you, Professor Stain and enjoy the webinar. Tia, thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Uh, Tia, to you and Handley and the team, everyone working hard behind the scenes. Thank you for setting up this event. Uh, it's a wonderful honor to be able to speak about a very, very serious topic. And uh, mm -hmm. before I get into my slides, I want to tell you about my son, because it's him mm -hmm. more than anything that has um, spurred me on this AI journey that I'm on. You know, about, I think it was about eight years ago, I worked for one of our big banks and one of our global consulting firms um, said they wanted to do a proof of concept about AI in the, mm -hmm. the vision that I was working in. And we know AI has been around for about 60 or so odd years. Mm -hmm. I've never heard the term. So I, so I thought I'm quite keen to see what this is. And the, the result of that proof of concept blew me away what this technology can do when it comes to pattern recognition, analyzing big data sets and the like. I then um, read every book I could find my hands on because I had wanted to learn. But it's interesting, my that if you would discovery of AI and becoming a father happened pretty much at the same time. And uh, the, the thing that's really been spurring me on over the last few years is what world will my son, who is nine now, uh, grow up in one day mm. he's 30 or 35 you know will they grow up in a highly unregulated world where there's no privacy where government has or, or and technology firms have total control over them where access to credit and healthcare is limited to those who have so-called social obedience to the state mm. which is already happening in china for instance mm -hmm. um, and, and on the other side is this incredible benefit that this technology can give us in healthcare, in education, in longevity, in social equality. I mean, the, the potential utopian benefits are amazing, uh, Tia. Mm, My definitely. The more I've been um, reading and learning about this technology, the more pessimistic I've become, the more worried I've become. And, and and not from a Hollywood point of view, because the Hollywood movies are not showing us the, the real view of AI. You're you not know, telling us the truth. <laughs> no, you know, on the one hand, it is the most powerful technology humans have ever created. But on the other hand, it's not nearly as powerful as, as you know, um, media, movies and the like wants us to believe. The challenge lies in that it's becoming exponentially more powerful every day. So it is not a technology conversation. It should be an ethical and a philosophical conversation, you know. Where, and not just the children of the world, our children here in South Africa, where this technology is not regulated at all. You know, so I'm very excited about this opportunity, uh, Tia. And I know it's chat GPT, but I'm going to also go a bit broader on AI and ethics and the like. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much. And we are looking forward to the presentation. Thank you, dear. Let me quickly um, fire up the, the slides. I'm, I, I'm not going to bore you with a highly academic conversation. I'm just using the slides to get a bit of a, a framework, if you would. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat because we're going to have a 10 or, or hopefully 15 minutes uh, of time toward the end. And, and remember, me as a speaker, I learn more from the questions people ask than you can imagine. Because very often I will look at the question and I will go... I've never thought about it like that. Wow, what a question. So please, this, there are no stupid questions. Ask questions. Disagree respectfully. <laughs> let's, uh, <laughs> let's 
thrown together because no one fully understand this technology. We, we're all grappling with it. We're all trying to figure it out. So, Tia, I'm going to let me quickly just uh, share the slides and find the Good button. You. And then uh, you must just confirm when you can see it. And I'm going to go full screen on the slides. So, uh, yes. you can just confirm. You can okay. see it. Okay, super. So, deep dive into chat GPT-4. Or GPT-4. Now, it's in an hour. It's actually not a deep dive because there's so much to say about this. Um, on the one hand, the great excitement. You know, I think when OpenAI released um, Chat GPT or version 3.5, and I think it was November last year, and subsequently, it's really brought artificial intelligence to the front and center of a lot of needed conversations with people who never really thought about it necessarily. Um, it was, it's been in the media like crazy and popular media, not just the technology media, um, you know, on TV, on, on radio, on, on newsletters, on blogs. People have been going crazy about this technology for the good and for the bad. A lot of conspiracy theories around it, a lot of over-enthusiasm, which is almost equally dangerous for me than the conspiracy theories. But I think there's never been as much talk about AI and debate and grappling about the future of, of us as humans as there is now. And it's, for me, a welcome conversation. We have to have it. We can't be sleeping at the wheel. It's not the domain of the technologists or the academics. It's the domain of all of us. If you're a parent, you should be worried and concerned and potentially excited about this. If you're a society leader, if you're in government, please govern people, wake up to this. Uh, we need regulation. We need to work together. So, yes, it's a deep dive, but it's in a sense just scratching the surface a little bit. But uh, before I get into my talk, I um, want to show you the agenda, but then I just want to touch on some of the basics that we spoke about the last time that we met. And I assume many of the delegates on this webinar were in the last conversation, but if you were not, that's okay. I'll just give you a bit of a, a sense of what we spoke about. So we'll start with that recap when we spoke about chat GPT or GPT 3.5. We're going to talk about what is this GPT 4 thing? What is generative AI? What is this large language models? I want to show you a very brief demo. And I want to touch on the demo I showed the last time as well. Because um, if you haven't played with chat GPT or similar platforms yet, I really want to encourage you to do that. Most of them are free. Uh, they're somewhat limited when you use the free version. Um, but if you play around uh, copying, pasting Excel sheets in it, analyzing the data sets, asking it to translate into, it into Zulu, asking it to um, rewrite it as an article, asking it to design the main points of a, of a uh, PowerPoint presentation, it's really powerful from a content creation point of view. I want to touch on some use cases. How do we make it practical. I mean, are we just talking about this or can we as business leaders actually use this in our day-to-day -day lives? And then something that is extremely close to my heart and hopefully to yours as well, the future of our children, ethical, societal impacts of this technology, responsible AI. I don't know if you know this, but the, the largest um, or the most important demand, skills demand in the future of artificial intelligence is not um, quants or AI engineers or database specialists. We have a huge demand in this era for academics, for thinkers, but for ethic ethicists and philosophers. We can't just approach this as a technology only or a technology first conversation. We have to reimagine our philosophy around this and the ethics because this technology is opening up a can of worms, so to speak. It's forcing us to think about things we've never maybe had to think about before, like what is it to be human? What is consciousness? If we have brain implants one day, which is already possible, it's not yet regulated and widely available, but the so-called brain computer interface technology. If I have an implant in my brain, and it not only can read what I'm thinking, but it's influencing what I'm thinking. When do I 
pivot the balance between being a homo sapien and something else? To what extent is my consciousness and my private thoughts my own? I mean, to a large extent, we can't still even today truly define what consciousness is. How do we as, as humans differ from other species on Earth, especially other mammalian species? What makes us different? What makes us not only remember the past, and because there's a, a fight or flight thing there that a lot of other species share, but something that's unique to us as humans is imagining a future, which can lead to fear and and um, and, and all kinds of bad things, you know, that we, we deal with. But no one has created a book or a white paper or a study or a piece of art, a painting, a piece of music or a business plan without imagining the future. That's one thing, as far as we know, that's only exclusive to humans because of our consciousness. But are we at the cusp of creating a species that is different than humans? You know, I often speak about, um, and depending on your own view of, of evolutionary history, but around 50 or so thousand years ago, human beings got the overhand, if you would, over Neanderthals. We're still grappling with why that happens. Is it the, the, the new cortex in our brains, our ability to speak and think differently that made us superior? But for the first time in our history, we are on the cusp again of creating a new species of sapiens. But this time it's not evolutionary forces of nature. It is we are creating it. Implants in our brains, um, artificial body parts, designer babies, the metaverse, and so forth. So I'm still uh, amazed how many people are not thinking about this, who are not grappling with where the heck are we going with this? And again, don't wake up in the mornings fearing it because the, the possibilities of a beautiful future is there using this technology. But we can't be asleep at the wheel. We can't go on as if nothing bad is happening. We, the most powerful technology we've ever created is not regulated. It's not understood. When my boy is 35 and he writes a letter back to me, whether I'm still here or not, what will he say? What will his counterpart say to us on this call today? And we, we, we can't all change the world. We, we're not Mother Teresa's or presidents of countries. But we all certainly have a part to play. We have to put pressure on governments, on business. We have to force some sort of regulatory environment. But having said all of that, then we're going to have a conclusion and a Q&A. Let me quickly just recap uh, what we spoke about the last time. And that uh, recording is available if you go look for Mill Park on YouTube and, and possibly on the website as well, where I demoed some of the, the, the possibilities of what you can do in GTP3 at that stage. One of the key things here is we speak about perimeters. You see the definition there on the screen. For me, a, a simple way to explain it, it's almost like an octopus with all these tentacles. It's the ability for these large language models to reach out and grasp as much information as it can on the internet as quickly as it can to be able to process a request or a prompt and give an answer. That's a perimeter. And one of the things I showed the last time is this slide. If you look there at the turning um, um, natural language um, generation model preceding ChatGPT3, it had uh, sorry, 17 billion perimeters, which is massive. But then look at the graph, 175 billion perimeters in ChatGPT3. The ability to grasp information on the internet quickly, amazing. Now we're on the era of GTP4, a trillion perimeters. Now the challenge we have here is that it's accessing unregulated information on the internet. And we all know the nonsense that's out there, the conspiracy theories, the biases, the biases against certain genders or, or ethnicities. I mean, it's the story of our lives. The internet that should have set us free to be more understanding of people around us have made us more secluded and fearful of others. The internet that should have given us the access to all the information we've ever created at the touch of a button on your smartphone have made us dumber than we've ever been before. 
there's a great article to read in on the Atlantic. And this is about 10 years old already. And, and that same author produced a wonderful book, but the, his article was entitled, Is Google Making Us Stupid? And the answer is yes. We are not learning to think anymore. And something that I've always been talking about is that in an era of teaching our children robotics and coding and digital skills, all of which are incredibly important, we should never stop teaching them to think. And I often speak about the humanities in university, you know, art, religion, ethics, philosophy, and the like. I call it the, the stepchild of, of universities because, I mean, what kind of job, what kind of good paying job are you going to have one day if you study art or religion or philosophy? But I'm saying we should teach young people the humanities before we start teaching them digital skills. And it doesn't have to be a three-year course, even if it's an introductory course. But let's not assume people can think for themselves in an era where we're trusting Google, or in, in this case, ChatGPT or generative AI, large language models to do the thinking for us. Let's train young people in universities and in, 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 in even primary, secondary education to use technology to be digitally fit alongside common sense, problem solving, human skills based on good ethics, based on the centricity of the value of the human person. So yes, look at how quickly this is expanding, a trillion perimeters. But I'm going to show you when I demo it that it's still not as smart as you think. So let's quickly talk about the, the next generation of large AI language models. So GT, GPT, as I've said, is, is generative pre-trained models. And one of the things I want you to see from this presentation is even though OpenAI and GTP and, and, and um, so ChatGPT and GTP4 have enjoyed most of the media attention, as to some extent deservedly they should, ChatGPT or, or OpenAI is just one amongst a, a massive amount of generative AI platforms out there. And there are some that specifically focus, for instance, on text to video or video to text or audio to text, or audio to image, and so forth. There are platforms that you can ingest large legal or academic um, documents, PDFs, words, etc. And it can much better than, than OpenAI's model generate uh, summaries, uh, rewriting those uh, documents, and so forth, than OpenAI's model. And today we are focusing on OpenAI to some extent, but there's a slide I'm going to show you. We're going to go through it quickly. and. This deck will be available, I'm sure it will be sent out to all of you in the next day or two. But go look at the plethora of other platforms out there that uses generative pre-trained models focused on specific business or use cases that is a lot better than OpenAI's model, even though OpenAI really set the scene, if you would, with um, what they have um, created. These days we are in what we call a multimodal world when it comes to generative pre-trained models. Now, the promise of GPT-4 is that it can do text like ChatGPT, and hopefully most of you have played with it, the prompts we give it, write an article, write a slide, there's an answer forth. Um, it can look at images, and I'm going to show that to you. According to OpenAI, it can ingest audio. Now, honestly, I've not seen that happen. I've not seen it ingest video. There are some other generative pre-trained models that can do it. You know, imagine you've got a, a one-hour lecture, an audio recording or a video recording of a lecture, and you can import that file into a GPT platform of sorts, and those exist, and I'm going to show some of them to you. And you can say, take this audio or video lecture and give me a 200-word summary, or give, create a PowerPoint presentation on it or whatever it is, or give me the, the synopsis of a book that I might want to write on it. OpenAI cannot give you that yet. It's good with text, and it's starting to, to dabble with image. Now, if you've played with Dull E, which is also OpenAI's platform, which is text to image, it's quite amazing to play with, and there are a lot of other platforms that can do it. For instance, in Dull E, you can say, draw me an oil painting in the style of Van Gogh about a man walking in a field. It takes a little bit of time, but it produces some amazing images. 
some of the topics I touched on when we last met is the biases in these data sets. Again, because remember, a trillion perimeters or 175 billion perimeters on unregulated information on the internet. If you play with platforms like Dull E and others, if you ask it to draw a picture on leadership or capability, 90% of the time it will be Caucasian men. That is worrying because it is building on the established and existing cultural stereotypes that we have. If you ask it to draw a picture on a role that is typically associated with traditional female roles, motherhood, caregiving, etc., mm. it will draw pictures of women and often of non-Caucasian women. So that dilemma that we have, this bias and this ethical dilemma, is a massive problem. Um, I, and I wrote about this once in Business Day, and I spoke about this as well. My son, um, he's adopted, so he's a brown boy. And uh, we did a, uh, a an assignment for a school project about, it was about four, five months ago. And the assignment was about, is are, are robots our friends? And we sat down with my laptop and we Googled images of robots or AI. And, and you must have seen this or we go and do this. If you Google AI or robots, most of the pictures will be of white, male-looking robots. Most of the Hollywood movies of robots or AI are Caucasian men-looking robots. If you Google images of robots that are associated with servanthood, it, they will not be white. So, and, and I don't want to get political about this. I'm just saying is it's the most powerful technology ever. It is exponentially expanding in its capabilities. To what extent are our stereotypes and our biases influencing it? I don't think we can be too serious about this. We should look at this. We should regulate this. Um, just on a side note, what I often tell my clients when they say, "What? how should we regulate this technology, given that there's no regulatory framework for it in South Africa or in most of the world? I say, create your own regulatory framework. But the core team that's developing this technology, that's rolling it out, that's implementing it, it can't just be technology people. Firstly, it should be a multidisciplinary team. HR should be involved. Organizational design people should be involved. The legal team should be involved and others. But also make sure that that core team consists of people of different age groups, of, of both genders, and even those who identify with other gender descriptions, and of different ethnicities. Because otherwise, you will create a lot of biases in this data sets. Make sure that it is a very representative core team that is working on this kind of technology. So back to the slide, the, the new era of generative pre-trained models is multimodal. And again, like I've said, OpenAI's uh, platform is fairly limited. There are a lot of other platforms out there in existence already and being developed that can bring in images, audio, video, and the like to generate text prompts, um, summaries, summary articles, and the like. So this slide will be in, in the deck that we're going to send out. It's quite busy, but it just shows you, if you look at the, the kind of categories around text, image, video, audio, 3D coding, and there's actually more, the kind of platforms that are, that are out there. And, and most of these are free to use, or at least they are free when it comes to a limited edition, so you can experiment with it, play around with it. I mean, if you look at images there on the right, Mid Journey, Mid Journey is most likely, I think, the leader of the pack when it comes to text to image generation. The, the images they generate that looks like a Hollywood studio is incredible, a lot more powerful, I think, than OpenAI's Dull E platform, for instance. But some of these platforms, you can ingest a 20,000 page legal document and say, give me the highlights. What are the risks? What should I look for? Summarize the document for me and so forth. And, and it's audio, 3D images and the like creating computer code. This list is expanding every day. But the, the one thing I want to just show you through this is that, as I said at the start, open AI and chat GPT or GT, GPT-4, they, yes, they really shook things up and they are amazing but they are just one of the many incredible startups and firms out there utilizing and building on this technology at the moment. 
So let's just quickly look at the news. And th this is just some highlights of the last week or so. And if you've been following it, some of this might be familiar with you. On this first one, I just want to show you that there are multiple firms out there, and a lot of them are global technology or financial firms, <clears throat> building their own generative pre-trained models. Amazon, or I mean, they, they've got Amazon Web Services or AWS, the, between them and Microsoft, the leaders in cloud computing. They, they've built their own uh, GPT platform. Um, prim primarily for the online customers. I mean, they're the largest online or retailer in the world. You know, sometimes when you go to a, a website, you are looking for something, but you don't know what to, you don't know what it's called. You can kind of explain it, but even in a Google search or, or in a Bing search for that matter, you don't always know what to say for the thing to tell you what you need. You can kind of describe it. We can describe the symptoms of the problem you're dealing with or what it kind of looks like. But if you use generative pre-trained models in an online shop, the ability for the algorithms to understand what you're kind of looking for. So for instance, I might say I'm looking, because I recently looked for this, I want a blue light. Because I find blue lighting in my house, especially at night before I go to bed, very calming. But if you look for blue light, whether it is on Amazon or on um, Take A Lot or whatever, the options you, you find is so wide that you, you just don't find what you're looking for because it's looking for keywords, blue and light. So is it the desk lamp? Is it a light above you? Is it like a spotlight? Is it a light for your car? But I'd love to have a little text box where I can either type or put my voice in to, to kind of explain what I'm looking for, even if it's very fundamental, elementary, almost kind of embarrassing. But that's what Amazon is doing now. The ability for me as a user or a buyer to explain in my most basic way what I'm looking for, for it to understand it and to point me to the right products. The other one you see on the screen here is Bloomberg, and this is very exciting. Creating their own generative pre-trained model specific to financial, the financial services industry and for financial analysis. Um, so analysts will, now again, it brings us to the question, do we still then need financial analysts? Or can AI do it? Or do we need both? Because can AI really replace the experience of financial analysts or chief financial officers for that matter? But go look at the, the platform that Bloomberg has built. And so if you, especially if you're in that, uh, in the financial industry, or even if you're an account payable or the procure to pay a value stream, look at what this platform gives you. And this is just two examples. There are many, many other firms utilizing this technology specific to their industry or their area of expertise using this technology. So depending on, and, and for academia for that matter as well, which is a can of worms of note, because plagiarism is the big question there. Do we ban it for students to use it or do we encourage students to use it? But then how do we examine them? How do we uh, prove that they've actually learned? You know, I've seen some universities that are coming back to oral examination because you obviously can't use chat GPT with that. Do we, some universities have outright banned it, some, some haven't, some don't know, most don't know what they need to do about it, even here in South Africa. It's an interesting conversation. Should we not have a GPT for research? Should we not, if you think of it, I mean, I often go to UNISA's library, not far from me, 8 million books, 8 levels, wonderful library a lot of it's digitized sometimes i don't know what i'm looking for unless i have the specific author name the specific topic uh, and so forth i can't find the book or the resources or the journals but what if i can in a conversational way explain to the library bot what i'm looking for and it can bring up the resources that i need based on a large language models understanding that would be great. Another use case that I'm very excited about is if, if think of this in a business. Now, if you've ever worked for a large business, large bank, large consulting firm, etc., your inter or universities for that matter, your internal knowledge base is massive. But say, for instance, in October this year, I want to take paternity leave. Just a random example. So now I need to find the, the leave policy. That's going to be a mission to find. It's going to be a link, and then I need to read through the whole thing. And then I need to find out, um, can I take leave in that time? Am I booked to certain projects? Um, do I, what um, public holidays fall in that time, et cetera, et cetera. 
So generative pre-trained models in a business context, when it comes to your large knowledge base, here's an example. So say I can say to the bot, in October from the 20th, I need to take paternity leave. Tell me about it. And it utilizes, now think again of those perimeters, those uh, octopus fingers drawing in all the information. It pulls in all the information I need. It's not giving me homework. Because remember, when you do a search, a Google search or an internal knowledge-based search, it's giving you documents or links to documents or websites that might have the answer, but it's just giving you homework. I don't want homework. I want an answer. So imagine in this case, I say I need to take paternity leave in October on the 20th, and it comes back and it says the policy is five days of paternity leave. If you don't take extra annual leave by October, you will have five extra days to take. Remember that in October, we have two public holidays. Keep that in mind. But also remember that you've already been booked to a project with X customer in that time. So you need to get approval from your, from your line manager. All on one screen instantaneously. Imagine that. And that's just one example of taking leave. Think of training, think of learning and development, think of so many things that we need to do in, in a business, the amount of time we're spending trying to find information. That's where these models in providing correct answers instantaneously can play a real a role. Elon Musk, I love him. I'm a huge fan, but he's such an interesting guy. I mean, he was one of the founding man, uh, members of uh, OpenAI. And, you know, he was also one of the signatories recently in the last week or two, if you've been following the news. There were about a thousand people, academics, ethicists, uh, philosophers, business leaders. He was one of them saying we have to rein in this technology. We have to actually put a monitorium for the next six months on not training any more large language models. But now suddenly he wants to create his own chat GPT. I mean, he's rich because of AI. If you think of Tesla, if you think of SpaceX, it's all smart technology-driven companies. He's one of the richest, if not the richest person on earth. And now he wants us all to stop when it comes to R&D on this technology. I take it with a, with a pinch of salt. Chat GPT-4 is five times smarter than GPT-3. Look at this Forbes article. Now these tech icons, like I've just said, are launching this petition. Look at this uh, Future of, of Life Institute, wonderful organization to follow. Let's just, there was this open net again, let's walk back on this. I call it an OFOK moment. Suddenly people realized, oh my word, what are we doing? Uh, uh, generative models or AI for that matter is no longer just conference speaking or, or webinars or exciting about AI or armchair kind of philosophizing about it. This is very, very real now. And that's why I think we're having this knee-jerk reaction to this technology. Now, can we stop it? Should we stop it? People have different opinions about it. I think we should regulate it more. I think we should be careful. I don't think we should stop it. Imagine when we develop the steam locomotive or electricity for that matter. What if we stopped? I think it's human nature. That's why we go to the stars. That's why we go to the moon. That's why we have satellites in orbit. That's why we have satellites in the further extent of the universe, because we are an exploring species. Uh, we would die as a species if we stop innovating, stop exploring. As long as it doesn't kill and destroy us, maybe akin to nuclear power. Imagine in the 1930s when we first split the atom. What if, if somebody didn't say, I know this is exciting, we can electrify cities, but what if we bomb and destroy cities? It should be regulated. We should be careful about this. Not everyone should be able to have their hands on it, but should we stop innovating, exploring, doing research? No, we shouldn't. We should keep on going, but doing it in a responsible and a smart way. And again, in the last two weeks, if you've been following the news, massive data breach within OpenAI's models where some of the billing model, the privacy detail of many of their customers momentarily became available. Now, they, I must give them credit, they shut it down very quickly. And, and ChatGPT was actually totally unavailable, irrespective of whether you're on the paid or unpaid version. But not for long. But, and here's the question. We know that from a privacy point of view, GDPR in Europe or POPIA in South Africa, you can't send certain customer identifiable information 
outside of your geography. That's why Amazon and Microsoft and others have built data centers in South Africa to give an assurance to our banks, our telcos, our insurance companies and others that if you use our cloud technology, it would not leave the geography. But when you put information into ChatGPT, where does it go? We don't know. If you put in a spreadsheet with very sensitive information, and you ask it for an analysis on that information. We know that it's very good at doing that, but it doesn't disappear. That information that you did a copy and paste into ChatGPT is stored somewhere forever. What happens to that information? And that's the kind of scary part, the, the, the security breach part of this technology. You know, even if you think of what we call phishing attacks or when you emulate another person, you know, if you get an email that seems like it's from your bank, a lot of people fall for that. We click on a link and immediately you get a, a virus installed in your computer or some of your, your personal information is being leaked to who knows somebody out there. This happens a lot. But what GPT technology can do, it can very accurately emulate the style of writing, the nuances, the language of another person. It's almost like a fake um, news kind of video or a deep fake that we've often heard about. So if you get an email from your partner or from your boss and the nuances of how that email is written is pretty much like how they write, you are much more probable to respond to that email, to click on that link than you would if, and we all get this, I often get it at my, my Gmail spam. Prophet Chabalala from Nigeria found that I, my late, late, late grandmother, has got $5 billion somewhere for me. And if I only contact him, I can get that money. I mean, my view is if you fall for that, you deserve to lose your money. I mean, most of us won't fall for that. But this generative pre-trained models can emulate the nuances in the language so accurately. That's a big problem. So just think of this. As much excited as I am about these models, when we copy and paste or when we type in a question, where does that info go forever? And who could potentially have access to it? That is a big question we have to answer. And here we've seen again in the news in the last two or three weeks, if it started with Italy and now the EU and other countries are saying, no, 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 we're going to stop this. We're going to ban this. We have privacy concerns, rightfully so. Is the answer to stop and ban it? I don't know. Is it to do it because we can't? I, again, like I say, I don't think we can go back on this innovation. But we can see news like this a lot more. Even our own privacy regulator in South Africa was in the news in the last two or three weeks saying they're really looking into this. If they ban ChatGPT in South Africa, I'm going to be in trouble. I use it so much. I'm going to just get a, a, um, a fake account somewhere else and, um, and you know try and bypass it. I can't stop using this technology. Not that it's writing my articles for me, but it helps me with ideas generation, helps me with the, the, the academic teaching that I'm doing and the like. So there, again, there's this knee-jerk reaction. For the first time, I think, in the history of AI over the last 60 years, where governments and regulatory bodies are going, oh, my word, they are way too late. They should wake up much quicker, and they should help us both regulate and innovate at the same time, which is a very difficult um, ask. I'm going to get to the demo soon, and I'm also aware of our time. Are they developing GTP-5? They say they're not. I'd like to believe them. And if GTP-4 is such a jump from version 3, exponentially imagine what version 5 would be like. I think they are working on it. I, would, I think you're just naive if you think they're not. Of course they are. It's about money. It's about staying ahead of the curve. It's about Bloomberg, AWS, Amazon, others creating this technology at the moment. How will OpenAI stay ahead? They have to keep innovating. But what will version 5 be? If version 4 is such a jump, even though it is quite um, inaccurate at times and imperfect. And then Microsoft Copilot. Now, again, if you're following the news if, or if you were in our last session, Microsoft uh, have billions of dollars invested in open AI and chat GPT technology, um, even in their Bing search engine. And it's not widely available yet. But I have it, and it's on my phone. It's not yet on my browser. But if you search the internet for something, you don't get just homework. 
again, remember this, when you do a Google search or a Bing search or any search engine, you don't get the answer. You get links to where you most probably will find the answer. So again, they're giving us homework. But with this technology, what Microsoft is doing with Bing, and if you've played with it, you would have seen it. On the one hand, you get your typical search result, a number of links that you can click on. But on the other side, you actually have a GPT answer. So if I, for instance, say, and I've played with this this morning again on my phone, what is the Rand dollar exchange rate? On the one hand, I get exchange.com, xe.com, news24, blah, blah, blah. On the other side, I get a dollar is equal to so many rands, which is shocking because it's zero point something, something, something. And then I just say, but turn it around. And it says, okay, uh, uh, rand is equal to so many dollars. And then I can start playing with some formulas on it. So we're really moving from search to answers. But now Microsoft has released this co-pilot within the Office 365 suite. Again, it's fairly limited release. I, I don't know if it's uh, available in South Africa yet, but if you look at it on um, YouTube, if you look at some of the videos across their suite, so Excel, PowerPoint, Word, um, um, Outlook, and so forth, you can actually text prompt it. When you have a PowerPoint presentation, you can say, change all the slides from orange to green. It happens. Change the order of the slides. Put in animations in slides three to five. Imagine what you can do when it comes to, to Excel. And I've seen those demos. No longer V lookups and trying to figure it out. I mean, if you have a 10,000 employee list spreadsheet, you can, for instance, ask Copilot, tell me more about the females under the age of 35 who are earning half a million rand or more, but only started in the company over the last three months. Where are they located across the business? Instant answer. How can you do that in Excel without really going through it? Again, we look up like crazy and so forth. It even can in Outlook, the demos I've seen, you can say, highlight the most five important emails from the last 24 hours. It'll bring it up. And you can say, give me a probable response to each email. And then it will, based on the history of all those emails, and again, this, the nuances around the language from the sender and from how you typically write, it will give you a suggestion of how to best respond to this email. You can still review it, but if you think this, this reply is quite good, click and it sends it off. How much time are we not spending on emails? I often say we don't really work. We, we do meetings and we do emails. We work at night, not during the day. And again, so go look at Copilot. Hopefully it will be available to, to Microsoft users in South Africa quite soon. But the productivity enhancements there are incredible. So now I want to stop this and I've got a 18 minutes left. Um, I'm not going to do such an extensive demo as I did last time, uh, but I want to just show you a few things, which is the good, the bad, and the ugly, really. This is your typical screen if you're using ChatGPT. If you are a pro user, which is about $20 a month, which I think is worth it. If you use it a lot, you have access to GPT-4, so you just need to make sure you, you click on that here. Again, if maybe you're not familiar with it, here on the left, you can see your previous requests. I often tell people when you have, so for instance, in this question, I ask it about a, write me an academic article on the ethics of AI. It will list it here. But when you want to expand on that conversation, make sure you go back to, to that conversation here on the left, because the models have the, contextual awareness of what you asked it before. Don't start a new chat necessarily. Okay, so the one thing I want to show you is just the, the image images. So you've got a picture of Table Mountain. And you, you're going to see that it's quite limited, but this is back to that multimodal thing that I spoke about. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to say, um, copy the image address or the URL. I'm going to go back to GPT-4. I'm going to I can either ask it what is this picture. I'm just going to put in the, the the URL of that picture, and let's hope that Murphy works with me. Oh, there we go. It's not working with me. <laughs> Let me just quickly reload this. Uh, and as as I said earlier, remember to put in your your questions in the chat. Hopefully, we'll get to most of them. I'm not going to say I'm a, a large language model, blah blah blah, but it's still going to tell me what it's seeing in that URL. Okay, so let's just wait for it to to tell us. There we go seems like an image of Table Mountain in Cape Town. Now it starts giving me a bit more information about Table Mountain. So, so I can't actually 
import a, um, a picture into GPT-4 yet, but I can use a link to a picture. And there we go, network error, but that's fine. It still showed you what I was looking for. The next thing I want to show you is around multiple uh, URLs. So I just did a, a search here on um, AI ethics, etc. So I've got three tabs open. Now, typically what we, we had to do in, in ChatGPT is if I wanted an analysis of this article, I had to copy and paste this text into ChatGPT. But what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to quickly highlight these URLs. You'll see here my notepad. I've already said write the summary article based on these links. Now, let me quickly put these three links in there. That's that link. And this link is from another website. Let me put that in there. That's the same one. Sorry, let me redo that. But what I'm trying to show here is that you can actually give it just a URL link to access and either build a PowerPoint presentation idea or a summary and so forth, and it will do it. But let me go there. Hang on. Oh, my word. Let me try and redo this. I'm just going to use these three URLs. It's still doing that. Oh, my word. Okay. I'm going to take this one for now. But the point is, you can put in a number of different URLs and say, take these different links or these different articles and give me a summary. So now I'm just going to put in this one. Let me just go back to GPT-4, although you can most likely do it in version 3 as well. So there we go. I'd say, give me a summary on these links. In this case, it's one link. Let me put it in there. And now it's summarizing that article, not from a copying and pasting the text of that article, but actually using just the URL to that article. And now it's going to keep on going. You can see on this document, I've actually... Um, I've done a few prompts that I just want to demo you. So this one, I'm just going to again do a new chat. And here I'm going to show you a massive flaw in this platform. So I've asked for a 600-word article on the ethics of GPT-4. And I'm just going to let it quickly run its course. If you use, and you can see up here, I did not select um, GPT-4. I'm still on 3.5. Um, on uh, GPT-4, you can only do 25 or 30 requests an hour. On GPT-3.5, it's unlimited. On, on version four, the response is much quicker. So you see, yeah, there we go. It's still busy typing away. I'm just waiting for it to finish, and then I'm going to show you something. I'm going to say now, so now it's written an article, but I'm going to say, give me the sources for this article. So now I want to, I want to reference this article. Where do you get these sources from? You can see a spelling mistake there, but it's fine. And okay, it's giving me some uh, network error. That's not good. Let me just regenerate the response. Just waiting for it. But because what I want to show you here, it will sometimes give you URLs or web links to where it found this information. Almost every time when you click on that URL, it will go to a page that doesn't exist. So this is a major form flaw in this platform. I just want to see if in this response it's actually going to give me a URL. So it's not. Okay, blah blah blah. Um Give me web link sources. Let's see what it does. There we go. Okay, so let me just stop there. So now, okay, so it's given me a number of web links to where it says it's found this information. And let's see if this is going to work. I click on the first one. Okay, that one works. I click on the second one. Oh, well, it works. That's great. I don't think this necessarily will access academic papers. Okay, I'm quite impressed. In my previous experimenting with this, is almost every link it gave me, it would go to that domain. So it might be a CNN, for instance, or a Oxford University link. But almost every time it would say the page doesn't exist. So it's accessing a page that doesn't exist. So it's interesting. But if you haven't played with this yet, so remember what I've said. So you can put in multiple URLs and say, give me a summary of what these URLs are saying. Give me a 600-word article. Give me a PowerPoint presentation outline. Give me a um, conclusion article, uh, con conclusion um, paragraph on it, or whatever your prompt is. But you can also now start asking it, where did you get this information from? I'm very surprised that all of these links are working. Oh, this is the one I didn't. Timothy Gebru, I love her work. Let's see if it works. Uh, there we go. Okay, so that one I skipped. 
this site doesn't exist. So that often happens as well. Academic referencing, it really struggles with, but it's definitely worth playing um, about this. Um, and then this is maybe the last one I want to show you before we go to Q&A because of time. But again, I'll put this all in the in the information we're going to share. So yeah, I've just answered, I've just Googled, which I don't do a lot. I really don't Google much. Give me BMW's balance sheet. Obviously, it's a publicly trading company, so the balance sheet will be available. So yeah, you see this, the balance sheet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, in fact, now it's interestingly enough, if I take this URL, and let me just do it. I'm going to say new chat. I'm going to say analyze this balance sheet. I'm going to put in the URL. It'll most likely not work. There we go. It's essentially just telling me what is a balance sheet. But if I take, let me just go back to Sorry, where is that link now? Here we go. If I just copy and paste this balance sheet and I ask it, let me go, new chat. Uh, nice, this. And I literally just copy all of that in there. And that's going to give me a fairly um, interesting analysis of that balance sheet. And I'm not going to go through all the detail yet. And then I can say, which, what are the risks? It says, I'm a language model, I can't do it, but then it gives it in any case, reputational risks, etc. Again, very academic. But if I do the prompt a little bit more accurately, if I say on this balance sheet that I've given up here, what are the risks given the politics in Europe, etc., then it does actually um, give me quite accurate information. So I think that's the end of the demo. I want to go back to the slides, um, given uh, realizing that our time is almost up, and I'm going to most likely skip some of it. In fact, a lot of this I'm just going to talk through quickly, and then we're going to get some uh, go through some of the questions and answers. So let me quickly unshare. There we go. I mean, it was a whirlwind tour. So let me quickly summarize before um, Tia, if you can just help me with some of the questions in the ten minutes we have left. GPT four is a massive jump from ChatGPT three point five, given the parameters, one hundred and seventy five billion to a trillion parameters. Open AI's platforms are actually just one of many, many other platforms out there. A lot of them created specifically for a industry sector or a use case. We mentioned Bloomberg. We, we mentioned Amazons. There are many, many others. There are others that focus specifically, for instance, on text to speech or, or speech to image and so forth. The societal impact on this technology, the social engineering, the imitating humans, how we speak our nuances is a massive security risk. Will it replace humans or will it do the heavy lifting for us when it comes to content creation? What about tertiary studies? What about research? What about creating um, academic papers? Do we totally block this? Do we allow it? Do we find a middle ground? But I want to just encourage you, go play with this technology. Don't just focus on open AI's models. There are a lot of other free models out there specific to what you want to use it for. It is very exciting. It's also very, very scary. And I hope from this kind of a bit of a rushed talk, and sorry for that, you've learned something from it. And yeah, I think I'm going to pause there with the seven or eight minutes we have left and see if there are any very specific maybe comments or questions that we should touch on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for the interesting uh, presentation, Prof. Johan. Um, it's quite insightful to know that technology is really, really taking over. It's really taking over in a massive way. And now there's so many other questions that we always have to ask ourselves. I mean, for example, as an academic, we had a discussion earlier with my fellow colleagues about, you know, AI and where are we going and how do we manage this going forward? So, yeah, to not waste any time, we have a few questions. Um, so I'll start with Izel's questions. She says that this is very interesting. How does this technology guard against uh, plagiarism? For example, when you give instructions to writing an essay. Mm. Massively important question, especially from an academic point of view. I find if you use a plagiarism checker, and I often just use Grammarly's, but they, you know there are many different platforms. Mm -hmm. Almost every response that uh, ChatGPT or G GPT four gives me, if I do a plagiarism check, it will say plagiarism found or 
a major plagiarism found because obviously it's it's pulling the existing data from the internet to formulating the answer. Um, there are some platforms that are claiming to be GPT specific plagiarism checkers. I've played with them. I've sometimes just messed around with chat GPT and I know it's total nonsense. It's just absolutely not my ideas. And then it doesn't pick up any plagiarism. Or I've used some of my originally written newspaper articles and I put it in there and suddenly it picks up major plagiarism. So yeah. I, I don't think the plagiarism models are ready for this technology yet. So, yeah. you know, I, I think what, what some universities are doing, and again, you can automate this with technology or you just have to do it as a human, which will take time, is looking at the previous writing style of a student. And whether there is a major change suddenly in that writing style mm. can you automate that they most likely are platforms but again uh, apart from that it's almost impossible to really pick up plagiarism at this stage using this technology and that is obviously a big concern for a lot of organizations especially educational organizations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no definitely um just to add on to that how now let's say you have a group of 300 students now, you mentioned that, you know, you need to realize a student's writing style. But if I'm marking 300 scripts, I don't necessarily won't. I'll ne I won't necessarily say student number 250. I know how you write, you know, so that would also be very difficult to, to sort of detect. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, thank you for that. And thank you, Zal, for your question. Our next question comes from uh, Shimin, and she says, I'm more intrigued with how skewed the data from AI is presented. Is AI encouraging coloniality, inequality, and social imbalances. We need to keep questioning these technologies. Very important question. And sadly, it absolutely happens. And again, it, it remember, it takes the unregulated billions and billions of data set on the internet that are totally infused with cultural and gender and other biases so um, this model does not think for itself. It does not. And although, you know, even an open AI, for instance, in ChatGPT, if you ask it questions about slavery and so, it'll give you an error message saying it's against our usage policy, depending on the context. So you can see they're putting in some. So for instance, if you say, why are slaves bad people? It will give you an error immediately saying we, we don't answer this kind of questions. If you say, what is the history of slavery in Europe? It will most likely answer the question. Mm -hmm. But in that the, what I mentioned earlier, this, these images of um, Caucasian males are associated with the data sets we have as leaders, strength, wisdom, blah, blah, blah. And females, and especially females of color, are of, often the converse. Because it is the, the biases in the, call it, Northern European Western world. As long as we are aware of it, as long as we do a lot to mitigate it, but this is also where we as Africans and South Africans have to work at creating our own data sets, our mm. own as, as biased, free as possible data sets. You know, I mean, if you think of chatbots, almost every chatbot platform out there are from typical previously colonial languages, English, French, uh, Portuguese, etc. We have 3,000, they estimate, languages and dialects in Africa. You know, mm. luckily we organizations like Mashikani at the UP and others who are working on creating it. But think of medical imagery. Even, and I read an interesting article, if, you, if we talk about breast cancer, even mm -hmm. African-American women in America who've been there for three or four generations, there are nuances to that disease because of their heritage that's different from your typical European, Caucasian kind of um, disease. Mm -hmm. We take these Northern American data sets into Africa to test for breast or, or um, prostate cancer, for instance. They're mm -hmm. most likely 50% accurate. The point is we have to create these data sets specifically for us and our people. But I mean, the point is, it's a massively important question. There are no quick answers, but we have to grapple with this and be aware of it. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I fully agree with you. Thank you. And thank you, Shamin, for your question as well. And the last question we have is from Jackson Mooing, who says, I'm also intrigued by what you shared. To be simplistic, with what capabilities does GPT-4 have in terms of preventing fraud in companies? None. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could over-engineer over that answer. <laughs> 
look that yeah. it's, both, look, it's a it's a important and complex question and and we have to say what does fraud mean um yeah if, if fraudulent activities especially through social engineering is where the, the the problem comes in if if you know if you ask somebody a question in a certain way because you have enough data on them and how they typically speak and so forth uh you can most likely dupe them if you would um as uh, you know and that's a challenge with technology as strong as technology is becoming for the good, for fighting societal ills, for fighting fraudulent activities, etc. Yeah. Yeah. The same powerful technologies are used by bad actors, and and you know, it's almost mm -hmm. but they they're almost like a step ahead of the, the good guys with utilizing yeah. this technology. Yeah. So yeah. sad the answer there is none that I'm aware of. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. And then thank you so much, uh, Jackson. Uh, we have one last comment from Steve Foster before we wrap up. He says, I used Samsung photocopiers that allowed you to scan documents to save an archive with the ability to access by name or word filter. And this has grown the filing and repository opportunity, opportunity massively. GPT-4 will make things available in a split second. Yeah, I agree with yeah. that. We, we so optical character recognition have been around for some decades but these mm. days you because remember you can either do a keyword search or you can do a contextual search so if i have ten thousand documents and i'm looking for the word fraud it will only bring up where it sees the word fraud but if yeah. it does a contextual search it will bring up documents that contain misappropriation of funds for instance and other things you know, so it's the semantic search. So absolutely yes. right. The ability to ingest thousands of documents, but to make intelligent sense of it within context rather than just keyword um, searches. Mm. Thank you, Steve Foster, for sharing that with us. Oh, we have one more question from Sean. And he says, I have read a post on LinkedIn that states AI is there to make you work fast. But if you choose to replace it and don't even put in 20% effort, you will damage your cognitive skills, your ability to think, read, learn, remember, reason, and pay attention. What are your thoughts? <laughs> wow. Look, I don't know about the percentage. Um, <laughs> okay. I do, remember I mentioned that article, is Google making us stupid? Um, yes. I, think, I mean, just an example. 10 years ago, if you asked me what is 235 minus 72, I could answer you instantly. Because oh, math, no, with a yeah. <laughs> yeah, but this, I have no idea. I have to really go and think about it. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. have to even type it into my phone anymore. I just ask my phone with a voice prompt. Yeah. So, but, you know, it also brings us to the future of education. Are we making our children lazy to think because everything is pretty much automated? Now, whether that will be a decrease of cognitive skills or just a decrease of the advance of cognitive, so I don't think we'll become... Um, you know, like Alzheimer patients, if you would, because we're using AI, like losing our cognitive abilities. I just think our advance on learning on the trajectory we should be learning is stifled. Mm -hmm. What that means for our future is interesting if we can't think, because what do you do when you don't have a smartphone or you don't have connectivity? Yeah. Yeah. Do you even know how to switch on your stove? Because there's no voice command. You know? <laughs> <laughs> now, when do we actually apply our minds and actually say, hey, but before all of this, I used to be able to do this. Exactly. So what just, has changed? And just an important thing, you know, something I often say, I know the time is up, but there's maybe, maybe quite a few people around still, but you can't automate common sense. You can't yeah. automate stupidity. Yeah. You can't automate mm -hmm. a toxic environment or bad leadership. So the mm -hmm. ability of humans... When it comes to common sense and intuition versus algorithms, there's still a massive divide there. There'll most likely always be one. That's why I always say focus on the stuff that we are good at and let the repetitive stuff we don't want to do in any case, let the robots do that. That's yes. the simplistic yes. way of saying it. You know? <laughs> oh, no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for a very wonderful session, Prof. Johan. Um, it was quite insightful. And thank you, everybody, for participating as well and the insightful discussions through your questions. And, yes, we were looking forward to your next session, Prof. So Thanks thank you. And it's only a pleasure. And good evening to everyone. Bye-bye. And thank you.